Hello there and welcome to podcast number 60 where we're going to be changing things up a bit but more on that in a minute because I am Steve and today I am joined by it's Darrow and we do not have an Ian with us right now but uh, he should be turning up a bit later so he'll jump into the podcast at some point hopefully anyway Daryl hey how are you man I'm okay how are you Stephen I'm okay so Stephen <laughs> so like i said we're going to change things up a little bit because we're not running our patreon at the moment uh we're actually not going to do a big topic at all in fact we're just going to start with news and then go on to what we've been playing because guess what we've actually met up in person to play some games for the first time in a long long I mean, time <laughs> we're, not, we're not allowed to talk about these things yet are we not i i uh Maybe we're a hundred percent fine at this point to be back once again and playing games in it's the legal. same room as one another. In fairness, we had one. We've had we've actually had two sessions, so that's kind yeah, of that's cool. True, we've had true. we've had one at our local entertainment store. Uh, please do go and check them out, especially if you're on kind of like the south coast of England. Entertainment are amazing, um, and we kind of had a board gaming session at my house as well. Uh, just a couple of us just getting together and just playing a couple of games. Um, but yeah, it's all been good. It's been, it's generally, how do you feel about nice, being nice. able to get back and play games again with one another? Uh, I'm not going to lie. I, uh, I, I feel like um, we weren't, just to set the record straight, we weren't doing it illegally, but no. I kind of wish we were. Because I feel like it'd be kind of like prohibition laws where it's actually better because it's, it's a sweeter game because you know that any minute the, the feds could kick the door down and be like, oh, damn it, they're playing Catan! Everybody get out the bar, freeze! And you just be like, I, you know, I feel like that's the, that's the thing that people are missing out on is these like kind of illicit under, like under the floorboards kind of gaming that you know that the top shops are cake selling cakes and bakery goods and underneath they're running a seedy little i was gonna say gambling den but i suppose it's actually just a gaming den <laughs> but anyway it's um I've, the laws in the uk now are we're allowed to get together indoors with uh groups of six people or as many from two different households so something like that or it's like 30 outside or something weird isn't it like out up to 30 people outside I, I don't think there's even a limit on people outside uh, anymore, i don't think can't remember what it's it's quite a crazy amount i know that but i know there's a lot of stuff like they suggest you keep windows open and keep everything well ventilated and stuff like that um it's funny because we've got an advert running at the moment and there's no indication that there's masks or hand sanitizer or anything like that around. oh the it's one just... where they just open the windows and it's like sat we're down fine and... now oh he's a bit cold maybe i should you know and it's like no just uh, get him a jumper you're like oh how british of you yeah but it's been really nice to actually just like get together and just like play a few games and grab something to eat together and stuff like that you know uh yeah, that's been, been a long long time of, coming kind of cool to do anyway shall we get on with some news I believe the people have come for the news. They've come for the news. Okay. They 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 come for the news. They stay for the gossip. <laughs> what kind of gossip have we got? I I've got nothing, man. Uh, well, uh, so there's um, I'm just gonna make this up as I go along. There's a guy called Brian, right? And Brian uh, has a sister, uh, and Brian's sister is sleeping with uh, 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 Dave, who is technically brian's cousin you didn't hear it from me okay sure thing <laughs> anyway <laughs> just make up stuff as a... i've had a long day i'm really sorry i'm gonna <laughs> just spit, spout loads of rubbish <laughs> okay let's jump into our first story that we've got here some of you may know about Catan 3d which honestly was like one of the most sought after board games for a long time um you if you wanted it you had to usually pay upwards of a thousand dollars for it uh i th 
it was made in limited quantity so uh i think there were only five thousand ever made of it and it came in this big kind of wooden treasure chest almost and had a uh, really cool like 3d printed parts so all your roads all of your villages all of your pieces all were kind of like um made out of plastic and they were all hand painted as well so a really really nice edition of Catan for like the real collectors but the thing is it really was only about maybe five years before the big board game boom of popularity and stuff like that so it had already been and gone so it's a real collector's item news here though is that they are actually going to be doing a new printing of it and unfortunately it doesn't come in its massive wooden chest unfortunately mm. it comes in a more Shame. standard uh board game box however if you've wanted to get a hold of the copy um this one's only going to set you back three hundred dollars i think they have to be bought through the website themselves um but it's a really famous edition of the game you've probably seen pictures of it before to be honest um it's a very very nice edition I've, i think they've been saying that it's been um the popularity of it has exploded for the past ten, in the past 10 years so it's about time to do a bit of a reprinting of this one um have you you still haven't played Catan, have you uh i think the only version of it i've played is possibly on um the switch oh, okay because there's actually like a vr edition of it out now and stuff oh, like really? that you know yeah um i think it's almost like a, it was made by this i think it was made either by the people that did pokemon go or it's been made in the same sort of vein as it oh okay like that kind of a that like augmented that's quite cool yeah, so, um, like, Catan has just taken over the world at this point. It, it's probably the most recognised hobby board game, I would probably say. It's between this and Ticket to Ride, I would say. Um, so, of course, this is just a really nice kind of collector's item uh, for anyone that's really interested in this kind of thing. Um, the shipping date for it looks like it's going to be August 2021, so it's really not that far off that these are going to ship. So, if you mm. if you want this one, head over to katanshop.com because it looks like that's the only place you're really going to be able to get it. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's still not that many of these being printed. Um, no, I, I can't imagine. That. Although, then again, for 300, I don't know what the what do you know roughly what the original went for or not. I don't when it know. first came out. No, I haven't <laughs> got a clue how much it originally was. Um, but I imagine it was probably a Could bit be more same. expensive than this one. Yeah, with yeah. the wood and stuff. I mean, $300 for a board game, that's <clears> still <throat> not at the price of something like Kingdom Death Monster. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which goes for around $500, you know, and I know that's a miniatures game, but this is kind of like something kind of special. Um, yeah, it's like a 10th it's, anniversary of the original, wasn't it? It's certainly more than double the price of Gloomhaven. You could buy two copies of Gloomhaven for that. But, uh, uh. you know, um, this is very much a fan piece. And if if you've been playing Catan for years and just want to up it that bit more, this is a very viable option for you. Uh, $300 is not too unreasonable, I would say, uh, considering... No what you would have to pay otherwise so it's a really nice chance for other people to be able to get hold of something like that um how do you feel about that i mean i really liked i when i saw the uh, photos of it i re i've never seen the original but i really like the uh the quality of like the miniatures like they've got that kind of um uh like the inking on them a bit similar to the uh what's the game i'm thinking of unmatched. uh some of the ones we've played yeah i matched and then the um not strontium dog um oh yeah i know the one the uh you know 2000 I mean? ad yeah um, oh god health skelter that's the one yeah and that's got that kind of sort of inky wash on there it adds a really nice detail to them and some of the um to be honest like i know it's just like little simple things like there's almost like some dry brushing on the trees that makes them look a bit better the mountains look really nice um it just looks really really nice the pieces look chunky and stuff like that uh, i don't personally know if 
if it was an option to get it here, so let's say like uh, Entoyment got it or something like that, I don't know if I could see myself spending that much on this game. Yeah, like uh, I say, however, I think... Sorry. Oh, no, go on, sorry. It's, it's just more the fact because I've not had as such... Um... This wasn't like this. This hasn't. I've never, like I said, I've never really played it properly. I've only played it on the Switch, so I played it a couple of times on that, and I, I do enjoy it. It's like a kind of, it's almost like solitaire, isn't it? Playing against yourself in a way, like but playing against the AI. I, I just don't know if I'd be invested enough to buy this because I feel like it'd only be for me personally, more of a display piece. Um, especially the way they kind of set up that picture of it, where it's like that kind of hexagon, um sort of tile where they've made like a little island in the middle and stuff like that i feel like that's all i'd have it as yeah i mean Maybe. uh it's definitely something like i say it's something for fans of the game i mean there are people out there that love this game and having a super nice nice edition of it it's really going to be for them um i mean it's worth noting that everything in this is a miniature basically so the tile pieces are miniatures. The roads, there's miniatures for those which are going to link up your cities and villages, which you have miniatures for. There's a little robber miniature as well uh, for the robber piece in it. like And all the little mum number pieces, usually, um, that you place on all the little hexagon tiles as well. They're all like plastic, almost tiddlywink style things with numbers printed on nice. and stuff like that. So, I mean, this is a super deluxe edition of this game. Um, so if you're a fan, now is your chance. Okay, let's move on. So next up, we have Asmodee. They are pulling out of Gen Con this year, which I believe takes place in September in Indianapolis. Um, this follows a whole host of um, board game design, uh, board game producers and designers pulling out of the event. Um, this comes courtesy of BoardGameQuest.com, uh, Lucky Duck Games, who do the Chronicles of Crime series, they've already pulled out of it, Yellow have already pulled out of it, uh, Peterson Games, Goodman Games, Kingdom Death, they've all pulled out of it, and there's many others as well. This is kind of interesting, because of, obviously Asmodee are such a big player, like... yeah, yeah. yeah. You're not just talking about all of Asmodee going, you're also talking about any of your fantasy flight stuff. None of that is going to be there either. Um, there's even now rumours going around that they might just cancel it this year. And a lot of this is still due to COVID and a yeah. worry that turning up to these events might possibly still be a danger. Um, which really is fair enough. But I mean, we've been talking a hell of a lot about uh, the UK Game Expo going ahead this year. And it kind of got me thinking how many of these publishers are attending that event. And again, it looks like, in, in fact, none of the ones that I just mentioned uh, at the moment announced for UK Game Expo. And if you look at their list of exhibitors on there, the vast majority of what you've got turning up to it are all uh, vendors rather than publishers and designers there are still a few in there like uh you've got some of the more local ones like osprey games are going there um i think warlord games are still going to be going to the uk game expo and also triple ace games who we very much like here over at everybody dice too so it's not like there's going to be nothing there and a lot of the social events are still announced for uk game expo but it's certainly going to be different and it, it's kind of like it, it just looks like that this has endangered one of the events um sorry one of the conventions um uk game expo seem like they're determined to go ahead with it um i mean we we've already talked about how we're not gonna go this year and no no a lot of this kind of just makes me not really want to go anymore this whole lack of um of um like presence, I suppose, by a yeah, lot of these big content companies. In a way, isn't it? Like, yeah, I mean, I I imagine there's still going to be a lot of stuff where, um, where they're still going to have a lot of. I imagine they'll still have display games of things from a lot of these companies that you can still have someone talk you through how to play them and stuff like that. I imagine, but sometimes it's nice to actually have like the designers and stuff actually there with you as well. Oh, I have just noticed, actually, for UK Game Expo this year, they have got the Pandemonium Institute 
Um, the reason why I find that really great is because they run Blood on the Clock Tower, um, which if you're if you're heading over to UK Game Expo, good God, check that out because Blood on the Clock Tower is something really really special. Um, but yeah, it, it certainly is looking like this isn't this isn't the year to start really going back to these things. Um, like, I, if you've got a social group of board gamers and stuff like that that perhaps you don't get to see very often, and this is a good place to meet up and play with them, I kind of feel like that's the drive this year because it's starting to shape up more like a big shopping event. Yeah, I know what you mean. But I mean, that's getting away from the actual story here. That that developers and and um, publishers they're still not comfortable with um, attending these events just yet, which I think still does say something. Um, I think next year will probably be when it starts becoming a bit more enticing to go along to these events. I think. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's going to be a bit more, I think, sort of opening up, isn't it? It's also, you've got to remember, it's a lot of the... It's not just our restrictions, is it? That's the thing. It's kind of... Um, it's, uh, like, other countries' restrictions coming in and out of. So a lot of these places probably can't get representatives down here. Yeah. Um, at the moment, it's probably not... I don't know. Like, I know, like, a lot of countries are having issues as much as we were. Um, we seem to sort of be on track a little bit, but I know a couple of months. So it's, I don't know if that's the kind of... I guess just until it's like perfectly safe to travel again, I think probably it's not worth it, is it, for some of them, which is kind of a shame, but... Yeah, I mean, it was always going to be an issue this year, so... Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, it, it's safety more than anything, and like you said, it's even other countries' restrictions. If you're having to travel and, say, fly over to these events, there mm. are certainly other risks involved there in oh, terms yeah. of, like, how your country is currently dealing with travel in and out of their own countries, you know? Um but anyway, um, I, 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 I hope for the people that do look forward to Gen Con every year that there is something there for them. But it's certainly starting to get a little bare at this point, I think. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's move on to something else. Let's have a look at a couple of Kickstarters that we actually talked about on the last podcast because they've actually gone live now. So we know a bit more about them. Let's start off with Robot Quest Arena. Now we talked about this already and have already kind of explained what the game is about. Uh, in a very quick summary, it's basically uh, arena, uh, an arena combat game with miniatures but is kind of like based around a uh, deck building kind of scheme. Um, and it's basically Robot Wars. Um, but now we know a little it bit looks more. looks great. Yeah, we know a little bit more now about what you're actually getting if you're to back this Kickstarter. And I'll put links to this uh, down in the um, description uh, so you can go over, check it out for yourself, and maybe even back it because this does look fantastic. Because it turns out that those miniatures that I was talking about in the last one, they do come pre-painted and they look really chunky and really awesome like it's so cool it's it's kind of cool because you've got kind of one that kind of looks like a rumba with legs <laughs> yeah another that looks like a cross between a dog and a pig <laughs> and yeah they're very cool they they're they're very very cool one of them kind of reminds me of um fantasy zone oh okay yeah like, yeah. yeah the red one so that's all very cool but what really stuck at, stood out to me was what they're doing is kind of like the additional content and stuff because you're going to be able to actually buy a couple of add-ons for this game in the forms of new robots for the game as well and they come in these really cool like blister packs it's it almost looks amiibo-ish to me yeah i get in that kind of vibe of like skylanders uh yeah you kind of you, yeah you, you um what was the other one? Disney Infinity and stuff like that. All those yeah. kind of like games where they had these little blister packs of figures that would like kind of enhance the game in some way or playable characters. Uh, very cool. Yeah. I, I like the fact that um, they're full expansions as well. Like they're not just like a robot. You get everything with them you need to play. And then also it's like allows you to have 
Yeah, so what's it saying? A new full color 40 millimeter ro- uh, 40 millimeter robot mini, some game tiles, the player board. So you're getting a starting deck, the cubes. Basically, it's enough the kind of um, yeah additional players, so you can add another player, like which I think is incredible. Rather than just being kind of uh, there's one called Jaws and Dimitri, and it's just it's very cool. And what you get with it, it it's a nice little package, I guess. Um, very very nice so we're actually recording this as well a few days before the actual release of this podcast and already at the time of recording here they've Smashed almost <laughs> raised 10 times their their goal on this so this this is getting made this is 100 percent getting made yeah, already yeah. uh there's still going to be plenty of time left on the kickstarter if you're uh listening to this podcast uh close to the release uh so by all means we've got the links in the description down below please do go and check it out for yourself i've managed to see some of the gameplay of this on some videos online and it does look like it plays fantastically so it does also seem touch word the um shipping wise to us it's not going to be an issue uh so they've got fulfillment centers directly in the uk i've noticed a lot more i don't not all kickstarters obviously but i've noticed quite a few kickstarters are kind of shipping from hubs that are sort of negating the uh well certainly for us the like the vat customs charge it was one of the things that really became a real issue uh when brexit first happened where Mm. um a lot of these kickstarters that you were probably have already backed and you were hoping would be sent out and would have arrived before Brexit, didn't? Because yeah. these, things, let's face it, I would say it's a delay. It's I would delay. say eighty percent of Kickstarters are late. I would oh, say 100%. It, it's. I don't think I've ever had one. I mean, yeah, we've had some great years, couple of years almost for some of them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, not mentioning any names, but yeah, they have been uh, impressive. <laughs> But they, I mean, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty and stuff like that over whether they'd be able to get your games to you without having to um, incur like a customs charge and stuff like that. Mm. There genuinely was a lot of worry over that. So the fact that they're doing this is really, really cool. Um, yep, that is Robot Quest Arena. Uh, check it out. And we've got one more Kickstarter to actually have a look at here. Uh, again, that we talked about last week, it's um actually, which also hey. is now actually available as a Kickstarter. Um, again. actually. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought I I thought I'd done something then, and you were no. About I, was to correct me. Do, I was just gonna do a stupid joke to be with it, but it's yeah, it is pretty much uh, so like pretty much good to go. If Robot Quest Arena had smashed its goal, um actually has absolutely murdered it oh like, my wow uh i mean yeah they've they're just short of what uh 18 grand they needed they've got uh, nearly four hundred thousand. nearly four hundred thousand. that's 000. ridiculous by, by the time this goes out they'll be they'll be over four hundred thousand. i'm so that pretty just shows sure they've that. got a massive um uh massive sort of following for that kind of style which is quite I'm trying to see how many um statues so many I'm trying to. I can't see the backers. How many backers are done it? Oh, sorry, I didn't realise this had ten thousand five hundred seventy-eight backers at this point. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, they, again, I think you know more about this game than me. It's essentially a party game where. Um, yeah. What is it? It's kind of like each player has to read out, uh, or they have to say stuff, don't they, about a certain subject. And then other people have the chance to correct them. Is that it? Yeah. So it's like uh, you you get like a kind of a card, if you will, uh, with like some information on it. And then basically it's designed for nerdier people to try and guess and um, find the fault within the, the statement. So a lot of the times it's uh, I'm trying to see one here. They've got like... Um, so it looks like you've got a number of categories. For he, uh, it. So yeah, so they've got, got they've got one. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to say you've got categories like fantasy, cartoons, comics, sci-fi, and games. I think in the deluxe edition, then you get anime, eighties and nineties, and horror as well. So um, I imagine you can pick and choose what you want to play depending on the yeah. game group you've cur- you're currently playing with. I imagine. So they've done a like a couple of the sort of options of like pictures they've put up are. Um... 
This is one about Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, it's basically about Doctor Octopus. Um, he uses a robot to swap bodies with Peter. After leaving Peter in a coma, oh no! And Peter's body becomes a new Spider-Man and dubs himself the Superior Spider-Man. And the uh, the the problem with that statement is apparently Peter wasn't in a coma. So it's finding the very small information within that kind of uh, sentence in order to kind of um, you know. And then you have to explain the answer. So in this case, it's Doctor Octopus punched Peter so hard he died. So it's it's that kind of interesting um, kind of concept, and then they've also got ones like characters. Uh, they've done one with um, <laughs> here we go, uh, <laughs> S smart employees slash killer android, and they've got Ash Evil Dead Alien, um, a colorful ghost, an Acme's Labs mouse, uh, Pinky from Pac Man, and Pinky in the Brain. So it's like there's some really cool kind of. Uh, disembodied hand slash fantastic fantastic four uh member and thing from adam's family and fantastic four so i love there's these kind of you know other sort of side bits to them um, oh i've just seen something that's gonna uh that's gonna possibly cause issues have go. you no it, it's the real life skills uh bit they've got a bit all on cooking and the words that you have to say are the American version, which I know some of the stuff is is different in this country. So, <laughs> for example, a long green vegetable, a zucchini. We don't have that in the UK. That's a uh, that is a courgette, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So yeah, I can definitely see there's going to be some. I can see there's going to be some things that are going to be lost in translation here already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that could possibly be problematic, but uh, but yeah, Dave. <laughs> There's lots of videos on here as well and stuff like that to be able to show you how the game's working and stuff. It is a party game, um, which you can get some pretty, pretty uh, nice extras for you if you were willing to pay five hundred Canadian dollars for this game. You get your choice of one of the twelve pops uh, props that were actually used on the show. So again. I think, all right, I mean, like, some people spend incredible money on Kickstarters. There's, like, £1,000 tiers, £2,000 tiers. Um, you know, some of these some of these are, like, personalised artwork. Um, we've, we've known, I, I want to, well, I guess, are we allowed to say about him? Sorry? We allowed to, we allowed to big up Mr. Garley or not? Or? Yeah, of course, we, of course we are. Okay, so Mr. Garley has just recently... Um, <sighs> Uh, smashed another uh, Kickstarter, and one of the things he was offering was a sort of uh, one-off art piece. So again, snapped up straight away because it was, a, it was a lovely piece of art. Um, so it's nice where you can get these kind of one-off things. So to get a prop from an actual show that you love, to be honest with you, it's probably there's people out there who probably pay that just for the prop. So but in this case, you're getting the prop and two signed copies of the game by the host. So, again, it's a win-win, in a way, for people that are willing to spend that amount of money on props and stuff like that. It's it's a nice little incentive. It is worth noting, though, that they've all gone. All is that as you go on that one? Yeah. Wow, man, that's, so that, that just goes to show. That's that's crazy. Like, not even one's left. That's crazy. Um, it's also worth noting, again, these are... Um, they've got a nice little kind of incentive if you... I mean, I, I originally found out that it's because I, I had the... I'd back the last uh, Wiggles 3D game. The, um, oh my God, what was it? Five Minute Mystery? Is it Five Minute Mystery? Oh, that was them, was it? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, reason okay. they sent me this is because they've, uh, yeah, well, the, I don't know if it's them or if it's their parent company, but yeah, Wiggles 3D have sent me it. And uh, they've given you kind of like an extra incentive for kind of coming back, which is quite nice. Um, so if you did Five Minute Dungeon or Five Minute Mystery, um, they've given you five, weirdly five canadian dollar credit um so you're getting fiver off basically in some sort of formal way and uh there's a free month sorry a free two month subscription to the serve uh it's like the dropout i think it's like a channel an online channel where basically this is shown so you've got like a lot of chance to kind of uh there's other stuff on there it's like college humor stuff um the companies the college humor people are pretty they're pretty good actually there's some really funny stuff out there but uh yeah so they're going to kind of let you have a kind of couple of months of that for free so you can kind of get all of the you know that kind of humor and that kind of like uh nerdier kind of uh, content if you will 
Um, but I think that's just really nice. They've done that. And again, it's UK friendly, which is, it says, all right, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of these bigger companies possibly can do this. And that, that makes sense, you know, in a way that they can not so much for the smaller ones, but it's nice that there's some companies out there that are kind of trying to negate this. Cause I know we said a lot of our Kickstarter type things, we weren't really gonna, cause of the import on a lot of them and the weight of some of these things, the price we're paying for them, like it's going to start adding up to some extreme kind of prices. But again, this isn't too bad. It's, you know, it's yeah. uh, UK friendly again, which is lovely. Okay. Right then. That is all of the news that we have. So, Oh, I have a piece of news, but it's ooh. technically not, you haven't got a picture for it. And I, feel I have not. No. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. There's a there's a man we know. I will not name him by name, but I believe him to be psychic, right? Me and Steve were playing games, and a certain oh. someone came up to us and mentioned a thing, a concept, if you will, about Marvel Champions bringing out Thanos. <laughs> I messaged him afterwards. It was like, tell me the lottery numbers. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, um, surprise, surprise, Fantasy Flight have announced the next campaign set for Marvel Champions will be the Thanos set. Um, there's a bit of information out there at the moment. Just obviously head to Fantasy Flight. We'll put a link in the description. Uh, or, or sorry, the, the the god that is Steve will put the... I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm giving you more work here. Uh, <laughs> he'll put it in the description. Um, but the only thing I will say, and it has a nice concept, is it's it's fighting all of um, his like goons, if you will, and then him as the final boss. However, there is a add-on in this which apparently you can add to any other villain and it makes it a bit more spicy. I guess you could say you can give them the Infinity Gauntlet. So the Infinity Gauntlet plus the different stones uh, can be added to any other game or any other campaign or any other con- like kind of one-on-one, whatever you're playing. So you can basically give the Green Goblin, the Infinity Gauntlet, and suddenly have the Rhino with the Infinity Gauntlet and certain stones to give him this kind of extra boost, like reality bending abilities, you know, time travel. I like the fact they're kind of thinking... Um, I like the fact they're thinking about things that they can implement to bring back into the older stuff. But yeah, anyway, have a look at it. It looks cool. Uh, artwork's beaut as per uh, normal with them, so could be fun. Cool. Good stuff. In that case, shall we move on to what we've been playing? What have we? Well, you know what we've been playing. We have been playing a little bit of Onitama. Now, I talked about this a little while ago and how I kind of like introduced my parents to it, but me and Daryl both got the chance to really sit down and play this. And Uh, how how did you feel about it? Because I've kind of... I'll I'll just quickly explain. Onitama is a game that's kind of something which I would say is going to be chess for someone that's intimidated by chess. Um, it's kind of like a much simpler system. You have uh, five pieces on each side. You've got a grid-like system, just like chess. And you also have two cards in front of you. Your opponent has two cards in front of them. And there's a card in the middle as well. These tell you how you can move one of your pieces on your board. You move that piece in the way that the card depicts. Then you move that card into the center. And you take the one that was previously in center. And now you've got your two cards for the next turn. The idea is that you either want to take your opponent's masterpiece by landing one of your pieces on there, or you're trying to move your master over to your opponent's shrine, which is kind of the starting space for your opponent's master. That is everything that you really Mm. need to know about this game. And it is addictive. It's... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Really, really good. How did you find playing it? Uh, So... um... In short, I end up buying it at an expansion immediately yep. <laughs> after. Immediately after. We'll um, get onto the expansion I, in a bit, but yeah, I have played chess. I used to play chess a few times. I've played like checkers and stuff like that. The, the concepts are there. I always find them a little bit tedious. I prefer checkers over um, chess just because there's a bit more. I don't know, like the whole uh, king me thing of getting like an extra uh, piece put on top and then having the option of moving other places is nice. But again, it does require a level of, 
um, memory to the the rules and knowing the strategies and the patterns and stuff like that. Uh, Steve said to me, possibly maybe 10 words. I, I don't think even that, like 10 words and explain it to me in 10 words. And I was like, huh, that's it? And he's like, yeah, I pretty much explained it to you. And it was one of those things where I was like, that can't be as easy as it seems. And sure enough, um, I'm sure Stephen's already said about this before. I have a short memory. Uh, the setup is incredible. You've got your five pieces on the board, the the five cards, and that's it. You're just good to go. You you're using all the same cards as each other. Eventually, they re, like they kind of sort of rotate back to you. Eventually, I was just I was just addictive. It was one of those things where you you would know. You knew we were getting into it because we suddenly went silent for a good like sort of five minutes and we wouldn't say a word to each other. And it was it was it reminded me of those kind of scenes you see in films or in real life on videos where there's these kind of like older gentlemen that are playing chess in the park and they're not saying a word. But all the young people are on looking and they're kind of like, wow, wonderful. Ever gets that level. It, it feels like you become a grandmaster in this game just by kind of playing it, which, again, really goes to show that. It's a it's it's a it's a super simple game. Um, to the fact that I introduced it to Helen, and again she was like, "Oh, I, I was like, it's like chess, but it's not chess. I promise you." And immediately she was just like, "I like this game." Do you know what I mean? It's it's um, in fact she's reigning champion, and she refuses to rematch. But that's not the point. <laughs> she uh, <laughs> honestly, it's driving me mad. I tried to have another game with her, and she, we had to get dinner. I was just like, "Ah!" <laughs> um, but it it's incredible it's it's nice um i love the i love the the, the neoprene mat yeah um, very cool. i love the kind of detail to it it's got this kind of like a uh, very like kind of fluid watery color kind of style to it uh the miniatures are really nice solid chunky pieces i i really really like the i guess they're like haikus maybe or like little words of wisdom on the cards themselves so each card's named after one of the animals from the zodiac i assume it's from the zodiac isn't it uh, it goes a bit beyond that, but yeah. Does it go a bit beyond? So there's a load of those kind of like um, sort of themes running through it, and I just love some of the little kind of descriptions on them. Like, it's just it's just really nice. It's quite a simple game. The, the, there's not a lot to really take on, and it's nice as well knowing you start becoming to this point where you're not really seeing just your moves. You're seeing your opponent's moves, and then you're seeing how, although you only have two cars to use there's that sort of there's that third one potentially in the middle for free when you rotate or whatever it's it's knowing that what i'm doing now all right i'm getting that middle card i'm then giving steven my card then steven's going to be able to use that card either against me or hold on to it which happened quite a few times we were holding on to specific cards because we needed to move forwards rather than say diagonally and uh, there was there was definitely those plays of like because the dragon card you had you didn't want to get rid of it initially did you you were holding on to it because it had some really interesting yeah. almost like sidestep abilities where it kind of jumped to and went across and you were like and it, it proved to be quite tricky to kind of get rid of that and there's a couple of like just just basic ones like uh, like a T shape upside down that you don't want to get rid of because you have this mobility to move forwards which is really useful for trying to get into that sanctuary yeah. or just left and right to take stuff and. It's that, it's planning ahead. Like, you're not just planning your moves, you're planning almost two moves ahead because you want to know, okay, well, if, if he gets that, what's he potentially going to give me? And then if I can use that the third time round, like, what? I just, I thought it was incredible. I you thought can, it was a really good game. It's worth saying that you can see everything that can be done on the board all the time. 100%. Yeah, if which you is incredible. Yeah, if you miss something, it's kind of your fault, really. It, it's it's literally it's yes, it illustrated is. on there and it makes it so much simpler but it also makes it quicker as well and just <laughs> just so easy to play it's it's amazing it's such a good game i mean but uh, what, what did we do like three three games maybe the first time and then we played another sort of three afterwards uh steve was like you've not learned and basically he got me twice with the same move and then after that because like he says everything's on view you kind of go do you know what? That's an option. That's a that's a potential opportunity. He can always go diagonally towards me, and I'm like, so then it's then you suddenly you're like thinking outside the box. You're like, oh, okay. Well, now I, now in my mind, I know that there's a potential that you. It's not just forward and back and left and right. It's diagonals as well. It's one At of any the given time. That, yeah, it was one of those things which I did mention to you after a while of. Uh, 
it, it is kind of an important move to move back when you need to, you know, yes, and, and 100%, retreat a bit. 100%. Like it, it's something you can do in this game that obviously you can't do in chess. But um, but yeah, um, you learn after a while. But let's talk a little bit about the expansion as well because these there's a really interesting expansion. What was it called? It was something of the wind. Uh, path of the wind. Path of the wind, or it was something along the lines of those, where you get a little uh, wind miniature that starts in the centre of the board, and on your turn you can choose to either move that wind spirit with a regular card, or you can use one of the cards that allows you to move two of your pieces uh, in one move, but then you have to move the wind spirit in the way that it depicts as well, um, yeah. and it kind Wait. of really changes the game because the wind spirit cannot eliminate another piece it will swap positions with it if it lands on another piece so you can really throw your opponent into a confusion by moving one of their pieces that they perhaps were banking mm. on moving in a certain way you can move your own into a position where usually it wouldn't be able to get to um it's yeah. worth noting that the wind spirit always moves after the other pieces so so i'm you can't take the wind spirits move move your piece and then move your piece again by then using yeah. the movement the wind spirit has to be done last um, it was just it was interesting because it has like it has like so many kind of like depth layers to it in a weird way because you like Stephen was saying you've got the because you've got the two dual cards like if you want to sacrifice one of your standard movements that's fine you just move the wind spirit but then if you use the wind ones You've got the option of using two moves per, well, one of your miniatures, uh, one of your pawns, or whatever, and you can move another one. But I like the fact as well that it has like a blocking ability in a way. You can never move into its space and swap it. It can only trigger that. So you can never physically swap places with it as a pawn. Um, it can only do that to a pawn. It can't do it to the master. That's the other thing. It can't go into a space with a master, which is also really cool. But what it does do, and what is quite annoying, is where it blocks it, it can very, very much be used as a tactic to block your shrine. Or your master, for instance, from another player, because they can't go... Say you were... Um, I don't know, say there was an ultimate move where you were going to be able to go that way, you could put the spirit near it and it would stop that, that figure from being kind of a part of it or swap it around. And I like the fact that it's not just a uh, move your sort of like a mess around, like kind of a chaos in a way where it pushes everything around. It can also be used as a defensive ability, which is I. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose we have to be fair and not be biased. Is it I I really like the, the concept of it, but we did come into a couple of issues with card. The, the design would... of it, it suggests. I, I think the way I'd put it is it introduces a couple of balancing issues. I think yes. that's the way I would put it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it shows you can choose to pick your cards, but we like to do it at random. Uh, and in doing so, we did get quite a lot of diagonal cards. And it was um, diagonal movement really... in the same direction, wasn't it? Which really yeah. kind of messed with it a bit. And we just ended up kind of... Well, I very much ended up just constantly going back and forth into one corner which wasn't ideal for me uh and eventually steve kind of took advantage of that because i was in the back corner i could only go back and forth back and forth back and forth um so we did sort of the second time round, we had a lot better pull if you will from the cards there was a lot more left right up downs sort of just you know normal kind of style moves and that and there was a couple of diagonals but it, it helped having the kind of standard set moves which was nice um yeah, I think uh, I think as long as you get a good uh, good selection and variety of cards rather than just sort of very similar cards, you're uh, you're not going to have any problems with this. But then again, I suppose um, I'm going to get it at some point because I want the set now because I'm like that. But I'm probably going to buy the is it like the Path of the Masters, which is just like a, just a set of cards. Yeah. Um, and just kind of just really shuffle it all together and just have this kind of uh, big selection of cards in order to choose from because I think it's quite a nice uh, I'm not saying we'll probably ever run out of cards through the normal game if we play it because I think we're going to play it a few more times but yeah. um, it's just nice to have that kind of variety to see the weird and wonderful animals and the, the patterns that they create um, but yeah it's a good game Like I'm, anyway yeah I've We'll go on to the next one because I think that's quite yep. similar. Okay. Right. 
let's move on. And we're back, but we've been joined by a wild Ian. Hello, Ian. Hello. Steve. Hello. Hi. Oh, wow. Right, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, uh, that's <laughs> definitely your groin. <laughs> okay, how are you anyway, Ian? Ah, oh, I'm tired, but I'm okay, thank you. Good stuff. How are you? I'm okay. I suppose can't complain too much. <laughs> anyway. Shall we carry on with things and bring in our next game to talk about? Yes. It's <laughs> X-Men Mutant Insurrection, which again we've talked about on here before. So, yes. I've played this now. Uh, yes, I finally had a real person play other than just the left hand <laughs> uh, that I basically was using. Uh, what did you think? I really liked it. I thought it was decent. Um mm. It's interesting running the comparisons between this and Elder Sign and Arkham Horror and the Marvel Champions game. Like mm. it, it, it's it's kind of becoming a thing with Fantasy Flight where they're taking a system that's been built for the HP Lovecraft style universe and they're kind of just shifting it and employing it to uh, the Marvel universe. Because yeah. we'll get to Elder Sign a bit later. But, um, yeah, I mean, I really like this. Um, it's a dice rolling game, so the idea is that you pick your superhero and you've kind of got your own stats and ability, so you roll certain dice with your character. It's kind of you've got red, blue, and yellow dice, don't you? And each character can roll a certain yes, number yeah. of them. But each character also has an assist ability as well which can remove some of the dice that you would be rolling and give them to another player, but you kind of swap with their assist ability so you get their dice. So if your yeah. character is kind of like really good at doing one particular thing, because the colour of the dice kind of helps you do different tasks, so they may have heavy like attack because they've got a lot of red dice or... I forget what the blue and yellow dice did. Like one was largely uh, like science based stuff, I think. Yeah, one something? was more science and one was more um DNA. Yeah, and the idea oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But yeah, the whole idea was kind of uh you had a bunch of tasks where you would have kind of like a number of phases to go through them and you would roll your dice and if you managed to match up the symbols with the task that you're going on you pass that task and you kind of like tick it off your little, little sheet with this um you kind of got these little pieces which actually go over the tasks and then someone else can have a try at the other ones or you could try and do every single task with one character in one turn so yeah if if a character is particularly heavy at doing one thing but not so good at another you can use your assist ability to just make things a bit uh easier to deal with so you can really start i i think you can only do it when you're on the same location as another player yeah, right and weirdly you have to uh you can you can choose to. You don't have to do it. Um, the only the only thing really, we were constantly doing it because we it just made more sense. Like we both had like abilities that you can only use your ability. You can't use your uh, the text that's on your assist. So it makes no sense for you to hoard it. Um, the only so way it makes more sense if, to give it to. The only way would be is if you had two tasks that you felt like you could both do individually. In which yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, so when you're in that situation where you're like on your own, that makes sense. But when you're together, it all you just always need to kind of give that other buff, like for you. So uh, for both of us, we kind of had abilities to train the other person. So the other person would gain. Essentially, it's like it's a symbol on the dice. So you don't have to roll that dice. You can just use the combat. You can use the DNA, or you can use the X symbol. So it just made it a bit more simpler for us to kind of get through these tasks and not need to worry about rolling so many dice all the time. What I will say is this was actually a uh, very much a story-driven game. Like, there was a narrative yeah. that ran throughout mm. where you played. And I haven't encountered that in one of these kind of games before, which was kind of cool. You kind of, like, play through a number of acts, which all then culminate in a big uh, kind of uh, fight at the end of it, which we did not yeah. succeed at, 
on, no. on our playthrough. So um, we kind of, I mean, I guess I guess we took quite a bit of damage, but we didn't really choose to ever go back to the X Mansion and do the, uh, the like the free abilities that allow you to kind of either heal or do this kind of thing. So I know we were going to, and then we sort of decided not to, because um, the problem is it costs you your turn. So in a way, we there was a lot of points where we started getting to. I mean, we somehow got a lot of. Um, so there's like a tracker at the top and basically it's like a threat level. So the more and more threat on a map um, or whatever is on the on the deck, if you will, will raise you up. And when you get to 15, which is the red zone, uh, you're done. It doesn't matter what you've done, you've done. Um, and we noticed that we sort of jump straight into the yellow quite quickly and then it produces a bit more stronger uh, threat cards, I guess you could say. So when you there's like a threat phase and you withdraw a card, um, it's like sentinels. And a lot of these sentinels had really hard individual tasks to them um which then added extra uh threat because some of them had double threat uh or we just happened to land on one of the cards on the continent had a double threat plus the double threat from that so it was if we didn't get rid of it every end up uh sorry end game part of the phase if you will we were putting on four extra threat which kind of got a bit extreme so we had to kind of really go hard on hit these hit these and a lot of them were damage dealing ones as well so it tended to we were kind of we were good for a while, but then we started taking quite a bit of damage. Um, you know, so we were, it was, I think we were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I think it, it's worth pointing out just how punishing this game is because, as such, before the final encounter, we only failed on one turn. Yeah. Out of, out of all of the things we did, we only failed once, and that cost us, basically. Um, yeah. I think, unfortunately, turn that we failed on though was a turn where we had a whole bunch of sentinels on the board and that throws your threat level through the roof if you don't deal oh, with it's them crazy. and crazy. i think our threat was already high enough that we had to just try and uh burn through the task and get to that final showdown as quickly as mm. possible because i i went out in the first round of the final showdown because i i went into it pretty beat up anyway and mm. uh, the game was up by that point but um yeah it's a, it's quite a um it's quite a it doesn't it doesn't penalize you for having less players it penalizes you for having more players in a way so two isn't too bad but you can have up to six and uh i feel like some some situations it would be really good for managing the the level of threat because obviously you're you can send multiple people off to do one thing while maybe you heal up or train or look at the top deck of the cards um the thing that we did differently from the game I played, because we did play the same scenario that I played on my own. Uh, it's the one they kind of instructed to do in a way. It's the Brotherhood of Mutants one, so you fight like Magneto, and then eventually fight all the Brotherhood, which is kind of cool. Um, we actually won mutants, didn't we? We rescued a couple of mutants, which again adds an extra level of kind of what ability you can do. However, a couple of them triggered only in the showdown, so it was kind of... Uh, we just didn't really get to use them. But yeah, they were... Um, I do... I do like the game. I looked through kind of a lot of more of the story cards. There's some really long narratives in there um, for like extra times and stuff. Uh, but it always kind of runs along the same pattern. You do the world events uh, depending on what they are and then work through the story, fight the boss, fight someone else and do that. Um, we didn't come across uh, the mute, uh, no, not the, mute, the enemy deck. I don't think we pulled anything from that, did we? It was all just the ones that were standard from the... Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I so there's that level as well. Who was we had one enemy turn up throughout it, but it wasn't one drawn from the enemy deck, was it? It was out. Of the oh, uh, it was either Pyro or Avalanche. It was Pyro. Well. So each each continent has its own uh, set enemy, if you will, um, which is fine. But then there's other potential missions that could make you draw from the uh, the the uh, separate enemy deck, which can then add extra enemies for you to fight. So it's it can really become a little bit out of hand. Uh, but luckily, we sort of made it to the showdown and just got whooped. Yeah. But <laughs> either way, I feel like this is a game that I want to play again. Um, yeah, I, well, I I enjoyed the fact that it's got a story beat to it. Um, yeah. and there's a lot of content in it as well. There's a lot of characters to be able to choose from, so you can experiment mm. a bit and try out the different characters with it. It's really neat. I really enjoyed it. So, yeah. Ooh. Shall we move on to our next bit? I believe so. Next up, we have War Chest. 
Now, I mm. I talked a little bit about this in um, in the uh, six great alternatives to chess video. Um, so if you want to check out a lot about how the game really plays out, I would suggest going over and checking out that video. Uh, but yeah, War Chess is another kind of... T- I would say it's a two-player game. I've not played the four-player variant to it, but again, it's got a few elements of kind of like a chess-like structure to it in that you've got a grid, you've got pieces that you're going to put on the board, but this one has a bit of an element to luck as well. It's kind of a bag-building game. So the Mm. idea is that uh, you play... It's an area control game as well. So you've got a number of points on the map, and the idea is you want to put down your area control marker um, on these uh, specific places, and once you've placed all of your area markers, the game is up. Uh, So the idea is you have four units that are going to be unique to you, and your opponent has four units that are unique to them. They each come with their own ability, so um, or they call it a tactic, which allows them to do something unique that no other unit can do. Otherwise, you spend your your turns moving your pieces or gaining control on things or attacking other pieces as well. So you actually, it's a really really nice production as well. Like uh, it's made up of loads and loads of poker chips which all depict mm. the unit you're currently using on, and they all have varying numbers of uh, pieces to each unit. So, like, for example, you may have... One player may have the cavalry as one of their uh, units, and someone might have crossbowmen on their side of things, and there may be more cavalry units than there are crossbowmen, because it kind of, like, evens out uh, how good the abilities are compared to mm. one another. Um, the idea is, out of your four units at the beginning of the game two of each unit are placed into your bag as well as a kind of generic token as well and then you what you do on your turn is you pull out and draw three of those chips and then you use them in whatever way possible so uh, say the chips you've drawn through your bag you may want to spawn one of your units on one of your control points or if you've already got pieces on the board you can use that same unit and put it in your discard pile and then move the unit one or you could bolster them to give them more health or you could use it to attack with them so what you're pulling from the bag you're basically going to get three units and throughout this round going backwards and forward you're going to be able to play them and use them you can also play them face down to do a couple of other things like uh gaining initiative so the first player always remains the first player until the other player decides to take it or you can use it by playing it face down into your discard pile in order to take any one of the chips of your cards and place one of those into your bag as well therefore giving you more chance of being able to pull that particular character and be able to do one of the moves where you need a very specific character piece in order to use it um, it's a really interesting game because, of course, this is one that people that enjoy chess probably aren't going to enjoy so much because there is an element of luck to it. Um, like, you are dependent on what you're actually drawing from your bag. It's a, an interesting choice you have to make as well. Do you just focus on two of your units and throw them all into your bag? Uh, so it gives you a greater chance of being able to pull two things that you'll be able to use across the board. That's kind of what I tried to do and it kind of came back to bite me in the ass a bit because Daryl kind of got all his units and were, was able to actually push them up. You'd be the board. very proud of me. Yeah, very he, proud of me, he yeah. absolutely crushed me on this one. Um, I did it with a history. Honestly, I did. I, and I, I genuinely played a blinding game and I was impressed with myself. Uh, in my defense, though, I genuinely think Steve has retired. Like, cause there, was a, there was a few strategic games I won and I find that very hard to believe. <laughs> so uh i don't know Maybe i think, need to play everyone when it's tired i think it's one of it, i wasn't tired i wouldn't say i think it was one of those cases where i loaded up my bag with um pieces so that i could better use the pieces i had but i couldn't get them out quick enough in order to because oh, okay. you you kind of just charged up the board kind of thing and i i so don't give myself enough time to be able to react to it so yeah that was a hundred percent my fault for doing it that way and I know it's, there were. Um... Sorry. No, go on, go on. You and I did my two piece. Oh no, no, you go ahead. I was kind of done anyway. Oh okay. Uh, it, it coming off the back of the on it uh, on a game. It was it was 
so much more to it, like a much more in-depth kind of game. Um, and I know you had to kind of explain a few more parts. But after a few kind of rounds, like you said, you got into it to a point where actually it's weird. Like, it's almost like a weird betting element to it, which I quite like. Like you, like you said, you were trying to get your chips into the bag in order to kind of ready yourself for the next couple of rounds so you'd have more units. Whereas I wasn't doing that so much. I was kind of holding off. So it was very much like a kind of... Uh, it was almost like a yeah, like a like a betting game to see who won the like the quickest is in drawing out the cut of things. Um but I really like the style of it. I like the fact that once you capture the points, you can kind of spawn in. I like each individual unit has like a kind of um a feel to it in a way. So like they mm. each can attack in a certain way or they can they can each move in a certain way. And I like the fact that they kind of they feel very different and you don't feel like you're necessarily, although you had completely different units to me and I had completely different units to you, they each had their place in a weird way. Like I know when you, uh, what was it? You, you wiped out like my guys really quickly with one of them. Was it the swordsman or something else? Um, I think I wiped out your cavalry fairly. You, you had, yeah. The, Cause you had the um, ones that had the charge ability, which is this ridiculous yeah, ability they... where, they get to move and attack but if you have units adjacent to them they can't trigger that ability and if they can't yeah, trigger that ability really they can't attack so it's a unit that you really want to swarm and mm. get in close to them because then you you essentially kind of cripple them a bit um yeah. so that was kind of what i was going for because the idea was like my perfect turn would be drawing three of the same chip because that way I'd be able to yeah. move something up quickly and attack all in all in the same kind of turn. Um, but I never had that throughout the entire game, which I was a bit bummed about. But um, it's a risk you take because, um, on the other hand, you you kind of put a bit of everything into your bag, didn't you? So you were kind of like slowly moving up four different units, whereas I only had two on the board. And... <clears throat> Yeah, it was kind of like I probably played one of my units a bit too quickly as well and made it mm. quite easy to read on the board too. So it was I made a couple of really big mistakes when I played it. So I think, yeah, I think it's definitely one of those games because we were only playing with the start recommended units. I'd love to go back and just make it up of whatever characters you can choose. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, so when I'm you just play, as well, I... you are meant to kind of like go through this drafting phase where you take every single unit. One person chooses a card, passes it over, they choose a card, and go. you go backwards and forwards. So people get to choose the units that they like best. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like in order of how you're doing it. Whereas they had two starter sets because everything in there kind of works well together. Um, I've played with the set that I was playing with on that one before and struggled with it. Um, I found the set that Daryl used was a lot easier to use. And that's mm. why I wanted him to be able to use it because I, I was already familiar with this game beforehand. And yeah, it yeah. turns out I still can't use the other set of four units. <laughs> I can't figure out just quite how you're meant to use them together. But yeah. So I've noticed as well you can buy expansions for them, which is kind of nice. Yeah, there's two different expansions. I think one has siege weapons in, and the other one I think mm. is... Nobility. Yeah, nobility. So I think they're more... Uh, strategic roles whereas what you get mostly in war chess is just units that will just attack and stuff like that whereas i think those are designed to be a bit more tricky i think but um mm. anyway what what were your th thoughts on war chess because i think it's a brilliant game i think it's really really good yeah i mean i really liked it i just think it was um I think it was just like it was. It was so different from like the easier levels of that on a timer game that it it just it, again you you had to think a lot more about um, what your units could do and what they couldn't do. So like I know at one point I think I I was convinced I could get uh, my scouts to do everything for me because they just basically spawn mostly around people rather than like kind of. Uh, but then it wasn't till sort of like you you sort of said to me you can't bring two of the same piece on the same part of the, uh, you can't bring two of the same piece on the board it has to be just that one version of each one and i think that's where it kind of gets a bit more tricky because you're trying to like think what can i do with this and like you say the the stronger units the cavalry were useless to me 
uh, I couldn't get them to go in straight lines because they just they couldn't. So it was like wherever they were, they didn't really have that option to do anything. Uh, the bowmen were pretty good. They they uh, crossbowmen or the bowmen, I forgot which one it was. They were pretty good for like kind of keeping you at bay because all I would do is sit them on an objective. Uh, again, Ian, super proud of me. I I took an objective and I sat archers on it, and he just couldn't come close. So it was like yeah. he just and then you did the same thing. He sat an archer on one of his. So if I got close, I was done. So it's this very nice kind of you had to fight for the middle ground battle, which was where I think, like you say, you just didn't bring out the units where I, I had the, the all most of my units on the board ready to kind of take sides or whatever. You still kind of only had the two or three, I think. And it was very hard for you to kind of get the exact chips you wanted in order to move the exact unit or bring the new unit on. It did worry me when you brought the, was it the pikeman? Yeah. He had pikemen, which were really nasty looking. I don't think you got them on the board at all, did you? Or no, did you get I didn't. I didn't in the end because they're good for yeah. if you if you get further in and then place them, mm. someone can't attack it without also wiping out their own unit. So it's kind of like it works mm. as a counter attack. So th this is one of the things you have to take into consideration in this game as well. Is you only will have usually it's between three and five of every single individual unit in the game. And when one of them dies, they don't go back to your bag. They go back to the box. So once they're gone, they're gone. So if you're too reckless, um, you can end up screwing yourself. I know you did that at one point, Daryl, where you, <laughs> yeah, I did. You, stacked, you stacked onto one of your cavalry. And mm. I realized very quickly that it meant he had no cavalry left in his bag anymore. So he essentially had something on the board that could not move and could not do anything. So I just left him alone hey, and it. just started moving over. The thing is, what I will say is, although it was a complete whitewash, it was a lot closer than it led on. Because one of the things mm. that I was keeping track of was Daryl was running out of stuff in his bag. And oh, yeah. I had a lot still still to go. So there was it. there was almost... The possibility of there being a point in the game where daryl just could not do I'd anything anymore mm. and he would have burned himself out so it was closer to the wire than it was led on because i still had enough to have been able to push forward mm. i just probably should have been a little bit more aggressive at the beginning and that daryl went on the blitzkrieg yeah pretty i much. did and he pretty much <laughs> he was kind of close to burning out uh, but managed to, in a way, he judged it just right because he managed yes, to judged it just right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> put but, all my chips in one basket and just pushed. But anyway, let's move on at this yeah. point because we have Railroad Inc. Challenge to talk about. Uh, before we move on to things that all of us can talk about, because me and Daryl played a game of this. Uh, I've already talked about a lot of the changes and stuff on the last podcast. Um, Really, I'm just interested to hear what Daryl thinks of the changes in this game because you did play the original Railroad Inc. And I just yeah, quite a while back, yeah. I just really wanted to get your thoughts on how you feel about Railroad Inc. Challenge because I've got a couple of things I probably would like to say as well. Um, chaotic. I should never be be allowed to be a city planner. Uh, this is basically the best to describe. I had roads going into nowhere. <laughs> I, I built them near houses. Uh, yeah, it, it was a bit. It was, it was mental. I think it was the fact that like, because um, you're trying to try and score as many points as possible. You're trying to make this perfect, like, like you did, where it was roads into like railways, into stations that led into like houses, roads into like the universities. I, you just. Because of the dice roll, you're sort of stuck with what you're stuck with. And then you've got the free ones at the top. But again, you can only use them once uh, unless you sort of do a certain thing. I just found it was a lot more... Uh, there was a lot more content to take on, and it didn't give me as many options as I thought it would. I thought it was going to be I thought I was gonna have loads of sort of time to kind of do stuff and do this. and But in actual fact, I was limited in what I could actually do. And I know... We, I know we both were, but it was one of those things where, again, I don't know if it's my brain went chaos and just started drawing lines everywhere and squiggling on a pen. And I, ru I rubbed out about six different things because I was just like, I can't have that. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'd like to play the original again um, at some point to sort of like to be a bit more fresh of his comparison. But 
um it was okay I, I don't have anything bad to say about it as such it's just i didn't really i don't know so I could take it or leave it i think Funnily enough, one of the things I've always said about railroading is it's one of the games that's just quite kind of relaxing to me mm. and uh, something that I could quite easily pick up first thing in the morning and just roll a few dice and just play a single player game of just drawing a lot of the uh, tracks and uh, roads on there and just generally having a bit of a chilled time just playing a nice game where you do have to think a bit but not too much. This one, you have to think an awful lot because there's all of a sudden there's a lot more to think about in here. Like you're trying to build uh, stations next to houses and you're trying to go through as many universities as you can because once you've, once you've built tracks through three different universities, you get to use one of the little bits at the top of your board for free rather than just being limited to the three standard ones that you get to draw mm. throughout the game. You've got the other one which allows you to duplicate what, uh, a factory. If you draw a, a line through there, you get to duplicate one of the dice rolls for that turn and draw an extra line on the track. Gives you a whole lot more to think about and perhaps rather than focusing on connecting your railways and roads into the various exits that you've got on your uh, board which is going to be your main way of scoring points you're now also thinking about yeah i could try playing that game but i'll pro i'll get more points if i try and link up all these things as well and all of a sudden it becomes this whole nightmarish things of you're probably taking on more than you can really keep track of now and it starts it, it does start to stress you out a little bit i was finding i don't yeah. know if you found that at all <clears throat> it and... did after a while like i know that we weren't necessarily doing it on the time limit but it was kind of a bit of a uh are we are we gonna are we am i gonna get enough time to do this like is this gonna work sorry i said uh are we gonna get enough time to do this kind of thing like, am i gonna get enough time to kind of make the uh the like the, the 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 pattern i want and then it just became a bit too like you say almost hectic yeah yeah and i mean this is still a really good game and some of the expansions, I've now been able to play all four of them. Some of them are really, really good. <clears throat> um, but it still stands to reason that this one definitely is for people that felt like Railroad Inc. wasn't challenging enough. It's in the name, mm. for God's sake. Um, and it's definitely that ramp up that makes it a little bit more difficult. Still really fun to play. I, I, I still really love this game. It's just taken away some of the things i enjoyed about the original one and that really is more of a preference thing really because i imagine there are a lot of people out there that want more gameplay in it and stuff like that you know anyway um that's enough about that because i think mm. i went into it in a bit more detail last time um our second night where we actually all managed to get together and play a few games kicked off with a game of elder sign now this was very much brought on by the fact fact that we played the x-men insurrection game and i thought i really fancy playing elder sign um mm. it like I say very very similar you uh the theming behind this is that uh we're all basically investigating a museum out of hours uh to basically investigate a lot of the strange goings on that have been happening so you have a number of rooms that are all laid out in front of you and you have to choose to go to one roll some dice and try and uh complete tasks on the board this one is a little more difficult than the x-men interaction game in that in the x-men interaction game when you finished a single line of tasks you get to mark it off your board and if you mm. don't manage to complete the other ones you get to just uh have more attempts at it without having already completed the tasks that have been previously completed in this one if you complete one of the tasks on a room and then fail the others that one gets wiped and the next person has to start all over again. Uh, you can mitigate this by having extra people on the location uh, who can assist you and be able to hold die faces for you should um, should you fail at a task and then you can save one that would be helpful to be able to complete the task later. Um, like I say, there's not really a story in this one unlike the X-Men one. Uh, you've kind of got... a big elder thing that's going to wake up soon and you have to try and seal it away before it wakes up uh your different rooms and stuff like that are going to give you different rewards and they're going to inflict different penalties as well depending on whether you succeed or lose at it 
and yeah you're basically just investigating a museum and going around and just trying to solve everything um it kind of like runs on this clock system and every time the clock strikes midnight you draw a nasty little event that's gonna do sometimes horrible things like lock dice away which are really gonna yeah. impede your progress and stuff um but yeah i this is a game that when i first started running game groups this was brought out almost every single night and i think you can kind of i don't know whether you guys could tell that it's kind of a worn copy at this point um it's been, uh, it's been loved it has been loved this game has uh and it was interesting just to go back and play it again um what did you guys make of this one i enjoyed it a lot i thought it was great fun um it's not something i played before i'm sure we played something similar and i can't remember what it was uh, Art of War. I think we Art we discussed this on the night, the one where you've got the Japanese yeah, the uh, yeah, castles yeah. and you're all fighting over them. Uh, whereas this one's a cooperative yeah. game. No, it's, uh, it was really good fun. I quite enjoyed playing my character who was <laughs> Monterey Jack. Yep. Was that his oh, name? Yeah, it was. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Monterey Jack. After the cheese, I guess. Um, all the cheese was named after him. <laughs> I don't know which... <laughs> Which came uh, first, the cheese or the man? <laughs> his whole gimmick is that, like, when he picks up a rare item, he picks up a second rare item as well, which was an enjoyable gimmick for me because I got in the image into my head that basically he used to walk into rooms, loot the rooms, and then <laughs> hurl the things he looted at the enemies, rather than be like, "I have a a book of uh, he- heinous things that I can read to this creature," or I've got some dynamite that I can light and throw at them, or I've got a revolver that I can shoot at this creature. His entire thing was just, yeet! Just like, an obsidian statue for like some sort of ritual. Yeet! <laughs> and, uh, I just uh, hoarded random ritual items, books, guns, and just held them. So it was good. It was great. I mean, that um, was the running joke. End, didn't we? we did win this one, yeah. Um, mm. We didn't even... Cause so... If you successfully seal away the monster, which we did, the game ends and you've won. If you actually fail, you've got one last encounter with the uh, Elder God itself, which is quite tough to do. Um, I think we even figured out that if it had woken up, it would have killed us all off pretty quickly, I think. Um, Because I think quite a number of us were uh, lagging a bit by the time it got to the end of the game. Like We were all quite banged up. my musician sadly died. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> what guy? Played his last flute. Yeah, jumps into a room for monster and just plays his trumpet at them. Uh, didn't really you work out well for him. You you, di- you didn't grab the trumpet and just go. Yeah, that's it. That is a hundred percent it. If you I, held the trumpet, you would have won that. Yeah, totally. Um, but there's a lot of things in this game. Like one of the things I really enjoyed uh, reading through the manual was. Um, they kind of like said that although your clock only runs from midnight to midnight kind of uh, sorry mid 12 till midnight or something like that so you're not doing a full day you're actually only doing 12 hours in a day or something like that the manual actually explains that the museum's actually open during the day so you just go home and sleep through the day and then come back and just carry on your investigation each day it's a really weird little thing where they've kind of had to uh squeeze that in somehow as to how that actually works which is kind of cool um because generally that's what you're doing you're a bunch of investigators going in and just trying to solve this thing and trying not to make horrible monsters appear i suppose and end the world which is generally what happens in hp lovecraft stories but yeah yeah. pretty much all the time yeah yeah um so one thing that i i will say about this game is every character has a number of starting items and if you lose those starting items, it becomes very hard to be of any use in a game. Luckily, I had a character which had a really useful ability um, where even on a successful roll, I could still hold on to a dice for them that's got a successful dice face. So it means you can carry out tasks a whole lot better. And he was still acting as a useful member of the team, but where he failed his first attempt at things and was left with no items it made it really difficult for him to ever succeed uh, succeed in a role 
and then start getting items back because items tend to allow you to roll extra dice and things like that and give you generally a better chance of doing stuff. There's no mechanic in the game where players are allowed to share items between themselves as well. So if you end up with no items and you don't have any trophies to buy anymore, you're kind of just stuck at that point and you're kind of just in a supporting role by that point. Um, that's one thing I would warn people about in this game. I think if, especially if you're lumped with a character that doesn't have a good ability, um, I feel like some people could possibly find themselves quite bored playing this game, I think. Whereas I, whilst everyone else is having a hell of a lot of fun, I feel like mm. that's one thing I would say about this game. I yeah, think. I mean, we, we got rid of the allies, didn't we, straight away? Uh, that yeah. went on the first night, so yeah. I don't think we've we... ever had a point where one of us would have taken an ally, I don't think. but uh, So it worked out kind of well for us, but we had something where we had to choose between an ally deck and i think oh, that was it yeah yeah yeah. We, we either had to lose the ally deck or add two tokens to the doom track where the doom track being what would measure uh how quickly the monster actually wakes up so when the doom track is filled up the monster wakes up and you have to fight him in order to actually win the game um yeah it's <sighs> yeah i i can I think we sided with uh, taking the ally deck out and it actually proved to work in our favour because I think we were only one or two Doom tokens off actually waking Probably, up the thing uh, anyway. Mm. Yeah, so if we if we had kept that ally deck in play, then I think things would have gone badly and none of us ever had to draw an ally. So it worked out yeah. really well for us in the end. Um, and that's it. It's kind of like it, it tries to... It tries to build a loose story around what you're doing in there. You're having horrible events being thrown at you and you're overcoming them through different ways. Like like you said, Ian, your your guy kind of built a bit of a story up uh, as he was wandering around this museum, but it's not as direct as the X-Men game. You're not having an overarching story that you're going through. You're just trying to seal this thing away and that's it. Uh, that's your aim. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, obviously, you've got the main bad guy, but like it felt like all of the other things that were occurring were just like vague coincidences. Like, this is just a room where you have a horrible nightmare or <laughs> this is just a, this is a room where there's loads of books and a bad person they're nasty to you and it's and it's the it's mad not... curator <laughs> yeah exactly so I, I feel like it would have been nice had there been i'm not saying all of them but like monster specific events yeah like um... it'd be a cool expansion to have where your like the the main villains have specific things that can occur because of them yeah but i know they have their own rules so like we couldn't have like the when you completed the extra things we had i can't remember what they were called now. there were other the world cards. cards yeah there were other oh, world cards, cards yeah. which when you... we completed other world cards we got dread but like it would still be cool to have like a card specific to each individual enemy that can come up that's very powerful that could perhaps halt you in your tracks mm. i mean there's the thought. like I, I i like the the narrative aspect of games so i just feel like as much as it was fun and we created our own narrative it would be cool if it had its own yeah okay very fun though like genuinely one of the one of the games that i've enjoyed the most that we played recently mm. oh man awesome. saying much because we haven't played a lot recently but it's more that like in the last even during lockdown where we've had games that we played sort of over different systems i, I quite like that one a lot I mean, I I still agree. I I would recommend this to people if someone came around and they haven't really played board games before. I I'd kind of like to play this with them. I know I know it can be a, quite rulesy, but it's a cooperative game, and you get to kind of like talk people through it as well. Yeah, um, I mean, it, as as rulesy as it is, it's made easy by your character having their own rules, and so long as you learn your own character, you're usually all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daryl, what what did you think of this game before we move on? Um, yeah, I can see what you mean about the whole, like, story-based thing of it. I like the fact that, um, in a way, it sounds really weird, in a way for me, it was how Arkham Horror, the living card game, is to Marvel Champions. So Marvel Champions is less of the story and more of the, like, just fighting one-on-ones, which is kind of like this. 
whereas Arkham Horror is more of the story-based stuff. So it's kind of similar in a way to how I see the X-Men game to this one. The X-Men game is very story-driven. Uh, it's not necessarily one and done scenarios. You're having a kind of narrative. They've to go kind along. of reverse role. Yeah, almost. exactly. Yeah, uh, I know. And it, I, I'm not sure if they intend to kind of uh, carry on with the X Men game if it was just a one and done type thing. I imagine at some point it'll get more. Uh, once you've done everything, it might get more boring. There might be some expert modes, but initially. Uh, the stories are there to kind of be played through uh, as little as they are. Like it gives you a bit of background fluff and then every time you flip a card, it gives you more story. But uh, yeah, it's that kind of comparison of the two games live parallel to each other, uh, ironically within Fantasy Flight. But um, yeah, there's two, you know, there's pros and cons to both. Yeah, I would say say so. Anyway, let's move on at this point because after playing a bit of Elder Sign, we finally played proper mysterium so we've played mysterium park uh together before oh, and this yeah. was the first time that i've been able to play mysterium with guys mysterium is still my favorite game probably um i really enjoy this there are a few differences between this and mysterium park so if i quickly go through how the game plays one player plays as a ghost and everyone else plays psychics. They're turning up at this mansion and they're trying to solve a, basically a murder that was ruled an accident yeah. like 30 years ago, I think it was. And the idea is that each psychic that's playing is kind of trying to set a scene. They're trying to connect with a person, a location and an item which determines people that were there that night, basically. So the ghost is trying to give these funny little art cards to each individual person and they're going to read into them what they can and determine who that's currently spread on the board. The ghost is trying to point them towards what location they're po- pointing them towards, which item they're pointing them towards. The ghost cannot talk at all and the psychics basically have uh, seven hours in game time Um to basically solve this after seven hours the ghost dissipates and uh they can't communicate at all anymore and it all kind of like culminates in one final round if every player that's playing has managed to find their person their location and their item then the ghost looks at all of those collections of cards chooses one of them based on the cards that he's currently got in his hand and then um basically says puts a token down Uh, face down that basically says which person they're actually going to point them towards at the end of the game and that is the murder of the person that killed them um it kind of like also runs on this system where this differs from mysterium park it's not just the fact that you're missing the items in mysterium park mysterium park focuses on uh people and locations and that's it uh this one also has a psychic meter you can actually vote on other people's guesses and say whether they're right or wrong that builds a little psychic meter up and should it build up enough you get to see more of the cards in the final round if you haven't done very well with your guessing you only get to see one of the cards and then have to make your guess as to who the murderer is whereas people that have done particularly well get to see all three so that's what you're kind of aiming towards in the game uh you all win or lose together everyone's playing on the same side um I prefer this to Mysterium Park. Um, Something about it that I had hoped would be different from Mysterium Park that was actually completely the same was that Daryl was completely unbearable. (laughs) Mm. Mm. Sure, I was was waiting for the the commentary to begin. I assumed you'd leave it a little bit later, but uh, spot on. Uh, Yeah, I... I Although, don't know. Albeit, I think I'm... with Mysterium Park, I got frustrated at you because you were poor, whereas with this one, it was just a genuine mistake, which I think yeah. is a, li- a little bit more um, redeemable. The mistake but, oh led to some was awful so... things. But In my, it it, threw off the, the thing whole is, game. once um, once you start getting into the nitty gritty of it and you explain it, it kind of starts making some sense to some people. So, like for some reason, Jay got on the wavelength i was on for a lot of his cards which worked really well however uh an early mistake well two early mistakes cocked up both ian and steven's characters uh, to which point they were thinking that they were the 
the opposite of each other. So uh, the difference with this one was there was a it was almost like a DM screen, wasn't it? With this, yeah. So this uh, is actually one of the things that I prefer to this over. Mystery yeah, Park. I like the fact so, that you've got this big DM screen which holds all of your information as to who you're going to be pointing everyone towards. So you're kind of looking at this screen which has the little ravens on top, which indicate when you're uh, when you've got when the ghost has a bad hand of cards, they lose a raven and they get to pick out a whole new set of cards um i don't know there, there's just something like the aesthetics of it i prefer over yeah. the mysterium park where you've just got a card and a little thing that just slots in um, so one of the the things that cocked me over a little bit was um where this this uh screen if you will had the information i needed unfortunately i placed it in the most inappropriate area so i had put steven's entire character and colors literally in front of ian so whenever i saw ian i went he's blue and went to give him the cards so it got to the point where i had given him the wrong card which was intended for steven i think it was the polar bear one uh which was perfect for steven because it was the polar bear rug unfortunately i replaced it and felt like i could bring it back and it just from there it spiraled into chaos because I, after that, everything was just... Other than Jay's cards, which worked perfectly well, and Jay got every single card more or less done, the others just didn't work. I think I milled the deck nearly twice. Like, I'd just gone through cards, 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 cards. Because the only ones I'd got were good, were ones for Steven. But because he'd already thought that he wasn't the Doctor, he thought he was the Steam Strust, I think, none of it made sense. But then, in retrospect, it did. And then to Ian... None of the costume stuff made sense because he was like, "Well, it's got a plague the first doctor." Thing you did was dump cards on me, but all of yeah. them had buildings in. So I thought, "Oh, Rich. I must be the I... <laughs> I must be the stonemason." So I got, in fairness, I got five cards, six cards, and they've all got buildings in. Yeah. Brilliant. And in then, fairness, I, I, I'm not. I think the first round you did cock up quite a lot with the cards that you gave to us. I think oh, in, yeah. the second the oh, second yeah. round was where you made. The genuine mistake of yeah, adding yeah, the wrong yeah. cards to the wrong person. The, but again, uh, but again you weren't using your screen properly. No, I know, I know. This is the problem. I think this is where the screen screwed me over because I wasn't utilizing it to its full potential, and also the fact that I put the cards for Ian right in front of like the yeah. So it just made it ridiculous. But when you got down to like the yeah, it's still fun. Don't get me wrong. I love I love the thing, but that cock up really cost me. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was good. It was it was, it, was hard, uh, it was hard to be a part of. Yeah, it was because obviously we we played two games of this. So Steve played the first one, and it just went well. Like it was it was really fun. Everyone got sort of decent clues. It wasn't immediately obvious some of them, but like yeah, they had like reason, rhyme, and stuff behind it. And then then we let Daryl have a go, and I've never regretted anything more in my life. Oh, come on, come on. Once I explained the, uh, the I was, doctor side of things, I was it made way furious. more sense. Bear in mind that I did still point out that a lot of the cards that you gave me would point towards two people as yeah, well. Yeah, this is... The problem is with the... <sighs> I think the the issue the massive issue for both of these games it doesn't it doesn't matter um, they're both the same in my opinion with that kind of stuff it's the little details in the cards that I potentially will pick out and then I'll go with and go oh well I hope someone gets that and I think that's the sometimes where it's like the bigger picture is what people will tend to see but they won't necessarily see the the like random stuff in the background like I know when I think must have been you gave me the rat card yeah initially with the rat <laughs> i wasn't looking for the rat i was looking for everything around the rat so like i was looking at the abacus on the floor and i was just like well what does that mean and do you know what i mean like because because the bear, fact bear in mind stuff, that, boys. so that one that was the one where you were you got very you that was the one where you got very focused on the rat and the thing i was trying to yeah. point you towards was the suit he was wearing yeah, because it was a which, very wedding suity kind of thing, and the location yeah, I was yeah. trying to point you towards actually had a dress in it. And I think even getting into the last round, I and you couldn't. This is what I love about Mysterium, though, the fact that I couldn't say anything. I kept hearing you say, oh, "I still has nothing to do with a rat," and and I, <laughs> I, he was pointing me towards a rat thing, and I was just sat there going, "No, I'm not pointing you towards anything to do with rat it's at all." So and that funny. hung there. The it's because it's such game. a like prominent that. thing. 
Yeah, I know. That's the problem, I, know. I think. Um, again, though, it doesn't make the game any less enjoyable, but even if it, the frustration is supremely real for Ian, and I appreciate <laughs> that. But it is one of those things where sometimes the cards... So, for instance, the cards I gave to Ian, the ones where I didn't really... I was just like, I've got nothing here I can give. I just gave them to him. I didn't really even find the connection that every single one had a building in. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those weird things, like because they might have a building in, but they also might have animals in. And that's where it got really confusing for sometimes because it was like, I think the hardest one to do was the bathroom for Ian or Stephen, whichever one it was, because a lot of the stuff just didn't really. And it wasn't until one of you twigged, I think, that you were like, well, there's water here and there's water there. But then the problem is there's water on two things. So it's, I think because there was so many water, there was two water places and then one was like an outside and it was just really hard to kind of get that push you towards one thing when there's other options out there which is it's just difficult but then for whatever reason jay's one's already always hit i don't know why maybe he just got the one card out of like 60 cards that always hit his thing it was ridiculous (laughs) but yeah crazy um i i will finish this up by saying the big thing that i think makes mysterium better than mysterium park is the fact that in mysterium park there's a lot of cases where the other players have to wait on other players uh Mm. so mysterium park had this whole system where you can't move on to the locations until everyone has gotten their characters so there are going to be rounds where people are just sitting around and not really doing too much where well they they can still contribute into other people's things but they're not making any progress themselves anymore whereas in this one once you're done with the um people you can move straight onto your location whilst everyone's still trying to figure out their um their person still and what's more is because you've also got this psychic uh meter thing where you're voting on one another's answers as well even if someone goes all the way through they've still got a part to play in it where they're still voting on other things and i get that a lot of people prefer mysterium park because it's more streamlined it's easier to teach and you can set up and play another game in no time at all whereas mysterium takes a lot more work to set up a game uh there are a few more phases that you have to explain to people but i feel like it's worth it and i think i just overall enjoy this over mysterium park overall i think um Another thing that I've come to realise as well, because obviously another game that's really popular with our game group is Deception Murder in Hong Kong. Um, Mm. It's got a similar kind of uh, a similar kind of way that the game plays in that you have one person that is silent and they're trying to direct everyone else around the table towards a certain thing whilst there's obviously a betrayer amongst you as well who actually committed the murder. I feel like mysterium still shares more dna with a game like dixit over deception murder in hong kong um it's real close between which i prefer out of mysterium and and deception obviously mysterium i do just prefer but i feel like more people are probably more on the side of deception i think i don't know Mm. what do you guys think I know you guys haven't played Dixit, I don't think, so you can't really no, make a comparison. No. But yeah. Um but yeah. We've got one last game to talk about before we go, and I don't think we'll really be talking about it too much. Letter Jam. Um we've talked about this on loads and loads of podcasts before, but this was kind of just the I I I, I almost feel like this is the <laughs> game that we've missed playing. Yeah, we did yeah, I, um, I think so. I have a complaint to make. Oh, okay. Here we go. About Daryl. <laughs> Why me? It's something I realised after, and it was a realisation, like like directly after the game, and I was sort of tired, and I sort of gave it some thought, and I'm still annoyed by it. So there were two. It was either two or three separate occasions in that game of Letter Jam. Where you and I had the same letter up at the same time, we must right. have done. When when I figured out my letter and I took note of it, I sort of figured from the letters you had and what I'd noted down, we must have had the same letter up. I can confirm. What? That. Yeah, you did. Why were you so unable to find decent words when whenever there was a long period of the game where I couldn't make any words? 
And I now know that we have the same letter and I could think of lots of words. Why didn't you make those words? Because I, I didn't have, I didn't do any for hardly any for you, did I? Exactly. But you could have. Yeah, but I, I had the other <laughs> people's words as well. You had all the same letters that I had to work with and I thought of some cool words, but I couldn't do them because I'd already been. Yeah, but what was the letter? One of them was definitely S. Wasn't there an S on the... There was one where we had... I think you had a letter that was also on the the three... The two in the middle. So, like, it was difficult to make one with yours and their one. In, and then, in, the, so in I, this specific instance, as I'm thinking of, we had exactly the same letter. We must have done. And Steve confirmed it. Yeah. What's your deal, yeah. sir? <laughs> Get good. Really yeah, but I rich. might... I don't, I think, so I don't think I had like, S. Yeah. I never realised I had S because I thought I got fucking... What was the word? What was the word I wrote down? Nibbles or something like wrong. that. Yeah, there was one where there was nibble. That was the word. Yeah, nibble, not... No, I put kibble, I think. I put kibble down for when you put yeah, something. Yeah, you did. So I, I got a K in it, and I had no idea what the word was. And then it was... I think Jay got whatever word I gave him completely muddled up, which was crazy. Like, he put a P in there, and I was like, where'd the P come from? Yeah, I think he got that from Nibble as well. He thought that was nipple. <laughs> <laughs> See? Oh, man. <laughs> He'd already confirmed that it was a B. And then when I said nipple, basically, um, he went, well, it must be nipple. <laughs> and you say, if you've already confirmed it, why would you go back on yourself? <laughs> Very funny. It's I, good, it's it, was, it was only it's afterwards, good. looking at the paperwork, that I realised how irritated I was. Because I was thinking of some really cool words. I was like, oh man, I've got some really good ones. And I can't say anything. And then someone did say and I was like, well, that must be that. But Daryl's got that, so why hasn't he said that? Maybe I'm... it's not that. I know one of the things that I'll say uh, in the game we've played, I... I mean, you guys will be able to confirm this to me now. I feel like there were two or three rounds in a row where the only vowel on the board was mine. Yeah. So I had it. I had yeah. no vowels to work with at all, and I was just sat there for a, was, for you, two or three rounds, just going, still, "Yeah, I can't, I can't do anything." More, you still got more words that were useful to us than Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, still... we've lost someone. Oh, uh, is it me? Um, I, I believe it is you. I'm in two different uh, areas. You you exist oh. in. More than one place. On Multiple planes. It's the Daryl There verse. we go. <laughs> oh, God. Now he's gone oh, again. No. Oh, God. Hey. I will take Ian's place. <laughs> oh, ah! God. <laughs> oh, God. Wait, am I alive? Yeah, you're, you're there. Like you're the there. Matrix. Well, I get so angry I disconnected my camera with my rage. <laughs> Maybe. But, yeah, I mean, I, I still think at this point, I think both me and Ian have never not managed to get their letters by the end of a game of Letter Jam. Uh, I got one letter wrong this time, but because oh, okay. it still it still made a word that was correct when guessing and putting the cards in the right order. Oh, so you still guessed all your letters correctly then? I still got the letters in an order that created a word. I just thought one of the letters was a different letter. Oh yeah, that's. Um... That's fine. Like it, the game says, as long as you've guessed all your letters correctly, then it's fine. It doesn't matter what word you make at the end of it. Uh, uh, I I guessed one of my letters incorrectly. Oh, so that would have been a failure then. Yeah, but still oh, made man. a successful word because the letters were interchangeable with the word I made. Uh, but okay. yeah, I did, I did. I got one letter wrong because Jay decided to spell something completely wrong. Oh, oh okay. where he, he missed the letter out or something. Yeah, so he he gave oh, me the word so dick, D I C. Oh, and obviously yeah. I, I looked at that and the opposite, like I could have had dip. You know, like I I know I think din is a word. Yeah. Yeah, there oh, I can't think of any now. Yeah, cuz I I remember like, there, there were so many letters it could be and I I end up going for P. Because I thought dip was the most reasonable. Yeah, because I remember I was actually done with all my letters by the end of that uh, end of that point, and that threw me off because I worked out that mine should have been my word from what he put down should have been D I C, and I thought 
that isn't a word, but doc yeah. is D O C. So all of a sudden yeah, I yeah. was going through this whole thing of, am I wrong about I? And in the end I ended up just going, no, I'm pretty sure I'm right with I. And he's just written that wrong. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, I think yeah. at and, this and, point, and, and another annoying trait from that is that after realizing that it was C and knowing what was on the table, I could have thought of a word that would have been helpful. Yeah. But, uh, I, my rage at everybody else needs to settle down. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, you, you just pooper. Just I... need to get good, please, all of you. <laughs> I tell you what. Yeah, hey, I, I don't think I've ever failed at Letter Jam on my uh, side. You, 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 you are the light in the dark, Steve. <laughs> That's all I wanted to hear. That's all I ever want to hear anyone ever say about me. <laughs> it's not much to ask. Um, yeah. Anyway. I feel like we've lost Daryl at this point. He has oh, yeah. he has gone into super. Still I tried mode. I tried taking over Ian's body, but it just didn't work. So he rejected me, and now I'm frozen <laughs> in time. Oh man! So it's like a parasite. So I'll finish up with Letter Jam by saying I still love this game. It's not worn off yeah. at all. I I I don't feel like we have to explain at this point how the game plays because we've talked about it so often on this podcast. Um, but yeah, it was really nice to get together and play Letter Jam again. That was really, really cool. Um, but with that, that brings this podcast to a close. So thank you very much for joining us on this episode of the podcast. Uh, if you would like to follow us on social media, you can find us at Everybody Dice on Twitter and at Everybody Dice Show on Instagram. We also have a Facebook page, which is just down there, facebook.com forward slash Everybody Dice. Please go over there and follow us on there as well. Uh, if you've liked it, give it a like, a share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And there should be some videos on screen now that you can click. Go and watch some of them too. Thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.